All right, today I'm going to talk about how I, how and why I quit eating sugar. And also, more importantly, discipline. What is discipline? And how do you get it? How do you improve it? Everyone's got some discipline in some issues, right? Some areas. And then the other areas, they don't have discipline, right? So if you've had, if you've made decisions and then not following th- followed through with them, this is the episode for you, right? If that frustrates you, right? And I'll tell you what frustrates me just right off the bat. I walk around, I've been in America for almost three years. I'm getting ready to leave and I'm getting my final papers for my Thai retirement visa, right? And one thing I've seen being, being home for three years, almost three years, it'll be three years in, in uh, March, March 5th, I think, is that a lot of people in America, and I just it's just amazing to me, they make commitments and they don't follow through. Okay, they they moan about things. You hear them moaning, you know, hey, I got to do this or, you know, we got to do that. Or one of these days we need to form this and I have to, you know, improve this in my life. I got to tell you, if you want to change your mind to the Ronin way, I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it regarding all this shit. Okay, that I just talked about. Okay, if this stuff is frustrating you because you can't do it, or if it's frustrating you because you're good at it in some areas and you're not good in other areas, right? You're gonna love this episode. Okay, I think you're gonna. I think the 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 twists and turns, and I'm gonna tell you this is added kind of motivation. Is as a man, your discipline is one of probably the most masculine trait there is. It is. It is something that separates men from women men have discipline and it is a it is 100 a masculine trait and if you don't if you find yourself struggling with it i think it's not as hard to fix as you as you might guess a lot of it is just understanding the mindset okay of the mindset of discipline okay so i'm going to go through first i'm going to talk about my struggle with chocolate ice cream okay and i would say sugar in general but it's mainly chocolate ice cream for me and how how that how i decided to do something and how i did it i think it'll give you kind of a somewhat of a bloop i hope to give you a blueprint in your own life okay the first thing i would say is i want you to start listening to your own words and other people's words okay immediately become alert and aware when anybody is talking about changing anything okay so if you hear anybody say i got to do this you know i got to improve my garden i got to make more money i got to wake up earlier i got to do this i got to do that okay just watch yourself okay again like i said in earlier episodes, like a CCTV camera. CCTV camera's got no emotion. It just films, okay? It just fucking films what's happening, okay? The beautiful thing about CCTV cameras is you're just getting data, okay? You're not changing. There's no stress. You're not putting yourself down. You're just watching. Focus on watching, okay? So watch yourself for a while, for a couple days. And listen, of course, your internal dialogue I'm talking about too. When you think to yourself, I got to do this, I got to do that. Why didn't I do that? I got to do that more. And then listen to other people like, they're going to do this, they're going to do that, they're going to improve that. Now keep watching. Now what changes? Probably nothing, Okay. You're probably going to see in your CCTV camera of awareness of, of course, scanning your own mind and watching other people, both their words and their behavior, okay? And you'll probably see there's a lot of talk, okay? But there's not a lot of things happening. Now, what a lot of guys will do, and this is what I think, this is what men in general have done until now, if you look at men's groups, it's always a lot of man up and this and that and be a, a lot of 
kind of bullying and shaming to get guys to do the right thing. I don't think that's the right way to go. Okay. I never liked that. I never, that never worked for me. Okay. I'll tell you that. And if you search your life, you know, search inside your heart, search the things I would suspect it didn't work for you either. Is that any kind of shaming, you know, a real man, this, I gotta do this, you know, it just doesn't work. It just, it's, it, it, it's sad because even it could be have a very good reason. You know, these, these, these guys could be trying to help you, but the method they're using does not work. That's partly why I made this channel. I just feel like a lot of men need a whole new way of thinking. Okay. In order to break out of the malaise and make the changes and to become the guys they want to become. I, I had to figure it out for myself. I, I just realized over time, like, it just doesn't fucking work. You know, the, the idea of like getting a trainer who's going to yell at me and spit on me. It's great for one workout, but it doesn't get you ripped. It just fucking doesn't. We look around at people. Everybody's got fucking trainers. Everybody's making decisions about everything. I'm going to quit that. I'm going to quit this. And no change. Okay. So you look around, what you'll see is that people will say, and also my other pet peeve is like, I realized this morning that this is the you know, worst thing. Anybody realize anything this morning, fuck them. Okay. It means nothing, nothing. Okay. When you say something now, like you quit something. Okay. And now you're looking back on it and the lessons you learned and you're, and you're fine tuning your keeping quit, basically, your different methods of not starting again. Then you got something to work with, okay? Because it's real. You've done something, okay? You've made, took some actions. Now, if the thing is really hard to quit, you might start talking earlier than something that's easy. So I'm talking about sugar two weeks after. And that's because it was pretty hard for me to quit, actually. It was not as easy as I thought it would be. It was easy for me to quit nicotine when I used to chew tobacco a long time ago. It was easier to quit nicotine than it was to quit sugar, actually. So anyway, that doesn't matter. What matters is, is that I want you to look at, at your life and other people's lives. If you are disgusted with the way shit is going in your life and the way it goes in other people's lives, that is awesome. Okay, that is very, that is exactly where I was when I was younger. I would just look around and everybody's moaning and pissing. I'm talking about guys here. Okay, I'm not talking about women. No influence from other people. This is an internal thing. It will make you a more attractive man for whatever reason. And it will make you feel better about yourself. And everything will, a lot of things will get better. Your mind will get clearer. Okay, you will waste less time. You will have more confidence when you have discipline. Okay, but what is it and where does it come from and why? It's a lot more complicated than, than uh, ABC123. So this isn't going to be a short one. Okay, so first step, you're now disgusted with yourself. And you can see that you're making commitments to things. You're kind of, things are just kind of half-assing and they're not working. Okay, that's good. Okay, that's awesome. You might think that's embarrassing. It's not. That's actually totally normal. Okay. That's why you make a change. Okay. That's why you make a change is because things are not working. If things are working perfectly, then you fucking do whatever you're doing and everything's great. Right. But other times they're not working. Right. A lot of guys, it's like this huge ego thing. It's like, no, it's like, it's awesome. It's like when you see something doesn't work. Right. And you dismantle it, you figure it out piece by piece, molecule by molecule. And then you find a solution. It's a very awesome fucking process. And you're going to have to do it over and over again anyway. Right. So welcome to the world. Right. Okay. So I hated that. And I thought, what is wrong with the world? Like, and then I looked at men's groups and the way that men kind of handle situations. And it was, it's kind of like, I don't know. It's, 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 it was kind of a uh, brute force method. Now, sometimes it works. Guys, sometimes this will work, okay? I mean, don't get me wrong. The kind of like, I'm going to quit smoking, fuck this shit. I'm done. Okay, that does work. 
Okay, especially if you are done, okay? Sometimes in life, this is one caveat to this whole thing of discipline, is sometimes it doesn't even require discipline, although it will look like discipline on the outside. Because people will say you're so disciplined, you quit, you know, chewing tobacco, you quit smoking. But sometimes there's a, there's a kind of a mystery here going on in the human mind. Sometimes people are just fucking done with things. And, uh, you know, they might go to a program, they might go to a 12-step program, they might go to another program, and then those programs get all the credit. But there are times in life when people are just done with shit. They're just done with it. They're done. They don't, they, they don't want it anymore. They are absolutely done. You know, I, I, I know a lot of, in my life, in my, as pro as I am at, at you know, different programs, and so I, I fucking have seen that some, when you're done, it can be really powerful. And it looks like discipline, but I think it's something else. It's just like you're ready to move on. It's kind of like uh, the dog is dead. Like when the dog is dead, then it's easy. Okay. It's fucking easy. Now, again, people are going to, you're going to look disciplined to other people, but you know, secretly that you were done. Okay. I think that's important to know. Look back in your life. When were you just done? And then you realize it and you thought, I am just done. I am never going to wear, you know, like maybe you had a personality, you wore a certain type of clothes. You, you, you just acted a certain way. Maybe you were like, you were getting bullied as a kid and you were just done. You were not going to be that anymore. And you never wore that again. You were just done. You were done. You were helping. You were being a white knight. You were being, you know what I mean? And then you just realize, wait, I am not going to do this. This is not working. And you were, and you, and you were just from every molecule of your body molecule, you were down to the, to the quark. You were like, I'm not going to, I'm done. Like this is relieved of my shoulders and I will let this go. So keep that in mind. Sometimes you're just done very rarely. And it's not a decision. This is almost like a, you know, when a woman says she's like creeped out by a guy, she's disgusted by a guy, you know, when you see like, I don't know that I don't even want to describe the kind of things that would do this, but there's certain things in biology and life where you'll look at them and you'll just be disgusted. Okay. You just want to vomit, right? That's a kind of a, it's a, it's a gut feeling, right? And when you got, I, I think this done is the same kind of thing. I think it's the same thing. It's an emotional, it's like just gut done. You don't need any logic. You don't need any discipline. Okay. Next thing, be aware that's a real thing. Okay. It's rare. Now, some people don't even experience it, but I've seen people plenty of people just quit stuff. And then they, I, I went to, here's what, just one last thing on this done thing. I've seen guys who are done. Okay. And then they go to some group and they give all the credit to the group, but actually the group actually had nothing to fucking do with it. Actually. Now, maybe they like the group, maybe they like the people and they're enjoying it. That's fine. But the reason why they quit, whatever it was, is they were just fucking done. <laughs> they would have quit a thousand years ago, 10,000 years ago. But now they, they, they appreciate being with other people who are done or whatever, struggling or whatever the fuck. They like to help you. It does, it's all good. Okay. But know your heart. Know the truth. Okay. That's what I'm talking about here. And sometimes the truth is not as, what do you call it? In other words, someone will compliment you. I'm just, just, just a little more on this done. You're done with something, okay? I was done with nicotine, okay? And then someone could say to me, you are so disciplined. And I secretly know that it was almost like a miracle. It was like a gift from God, okay? That I was able to quit nicotine. And it, the, the, the feeling has never come back. And the reason why I say that is because I'm aware that it could be taken away. That at some point, I could want to do it again or start doing it again. That is possible. You know, even though it's been a long time. I am aware. I am humble. Okay, what I'm saying. It was kind of a gift. The done is kind of a gift. It's kind of a gift. Hold on to the gift is all I'm saying. Don't test the gift. Okay. If I just chew tobacco one weekend, I'm spitting on the gift. That's my opinion. Okay, because the gift was easy, but I know, I know that if I spit on that gift, I'm going to pay. <laughs> 
So, okay, you got it. I was done, but at the same time, I know I'm human. I know that I used to be a certain way, and I respect the danger there, okay? I'm sure there's people that are done forever, whatever. But for me, I, I always have that caveat that I was weak before on this. So just, just keep that in mind, okay? Just keep that in mind. Don't, don't, don't test that boundary, right? Don't push that little boundary, right? Have respect, okay? Now, next thing. Most things aren't like that. Okay, so most things require discipline. So what is discipline? When should you have it? How do you get it? If you have it, what is it? Because even if you have it, you don't always have it. You guys with discipline don't always have discipline. Okay? Where does it come from? When should you use it? How do you improve it? Okay. So first thing we basically said is when you see people mumbling and moaning and making decisions. And again, this is on the respect thing. Okay. It's kind of like if I tell you, okay, this morning I had awakening. Okay. That is so rare. I'm not saying it never has happened in my entire life. There are times when I knew I had a realization, okay, almost like a revelation where it was so real and it, my whole reality disintegrated and I realized I would never think the same way again, okay? And I didn't need time to know that. I knew the moment it happened, okay? Again, my videos, there's always going to, reality is complicated. There are times when that is true. One of the times for me, I'll just tell you in my in retrospect, and, and, and okay, was when I went to Thailand in 1990. When I went to Thailand in 1990, in 1990, America was not as obese as it is now, okay? The obesity rate was way down from where it is today. But don't get, don't kid yourself. It was not the 1960s either. Okay, in the 1960s, and if you watch any, like, watch documentary on Woodstock, guys with their shirt off, girls with their shirts off, go look at those old documentaries and look how kids, let's just say kids, used to look. How young adults used to look. How did young adults used to look? They were ripped. They were thin. Now, muscles were not in style either. But they were thin, man. They were not obese at all. They were so healthy. But by 1991 or 1990, things had already changed. Okay. Already, you had a lot of women. And again, now you guys, girls are going to say, oh, what about guys? Look, for women, they're dating men. So they're worried about that. For me, I'm dating women. Right. So I'm... I was boning chicks, okay? So that's why I'm concerned about this. I personally was thin, and I wanted a thin girl. And I'm still thin, and I still want a thin girl. Okay? So in 1990, girls were already getting gaining weight a lot, okay? And when I say a lot, five pounds is a lot. Ten pounds is enormous. Ten pounds overweight. Ten pounds over natural body weight for a woman is a lot of weight. 20 pounds is ridiculous. And anything above that is just, it's, 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 it's dangerous, okay? I'll date a chick who's five pounds over her natural body weight. So when are you your natural body weight? When, 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 is, a, when is a human usually in the West, their natural body weight? It's usually when they're about 15, right? If you look at your waist size when you're 15, that's probably your real waist size now. Like my waist size now, okay, is 33, okay? And my natural waist size is 32, okay? That's my maybe even 31. And I'm going down, so I'm kind of, I quit sugar two weeks ago, and I'm already, I've already gone down. Getting down to a 32, I'll probably be a 31 in another, say, year, okay? Let's just say. Or, you know, between 32 and 31. That's like my, my, my natural uh, waist size, right? 
I should be wearing a 32 size because you, you got to give yourself a little flexibility, right? So a 32 is a good size for me. Right now, a 33 is a good size. 34 is too big, way too big. Okay, so I saw when I went to Thailand, of course, it was 1990. There were very few Westerners in Asia. And at the time, Asians thought, okay, that Westerners, okay, and I mean anybody in the West, was rich. Okay, so what attracts girls to guys? Height, right, money. So they saw, Asians saw Westerners as taller than them, which we were, and rich. Okay, so what what does that mean in your dating life? It makes you very attractive, okay? It has nothing to do. It really has nothing to do with race. Attraction was guaranteed in the in a large percentage of the population in Asia when I first got there. Just guaranteed by my height and my nap, my passport. It was amazing. I went over there and this was a bonus, okay, by the way. This was a total bonus. And when I saw it, I was like, this is amazing. I'm like, like, cause, cause, cause I wasn't rich. I, at the time I was, uh, just finished college. You know, I mean, I, I guess I was rich in a way. I mean, compared to, you know, third world, I was rich, but I mean, I was a college student. I had sold my car and, you know, and I had worked, you know, and saved money and traveled around the world. And sure, I had discipline with money. I always had discipline with money. It's a great place to use discipline. We can talk about that in the future. But discipline changes your life, guys. So this thing is all worth listening to. I'm going to talk about how I came to my own discipline. So sorry for the, you know, you guys know how I tell stories. I think they're all important. Let me tell you. So I'll just end this Thailand part. So I went to Thailand. Of course, I was more attractive because of those factors I told you about. And the girls were all skinny. Okay, every fucking one of them. I think the average weight in Thailand was probably 90 pounds or maybe less. Might have been 85. 85 pounds and everybody was real thin. The guys had 28 at your waist, you know. And Thais have smaller bones, right? So they're, they, tend to, they tend to have a smaller waist size. Which, by the way, you live longer when you eat less and you're small. You know what I mean? Like, there's benefits to everything. And I love to see old Japanese guys climbing Mount Fuji. I have great respect for those guys. Whereas, like, old white guys are dead. You know what I mean? These fucking guys are climbing Mount Fuji. So, I'm right there. I see the good and bad. There's good and bad in everything, okay? There's, you just got to look at the reality of life. Okay. So, I got there. Girls are skinny. And they're super attracted to me. And I was like, whoa. What, what the hell's going on here? You know, and and also because of my personality, I was never interested in prostitutes. I just they never it's not that they were never around, I just never that never turned me on. I was always interested in girls with that light in their eye who were riding me because they wanted to ride me. They were doing something to me because they wanted to make me happy. I always wanted that. I never wanted the fake love. I did never it just wasn't attractive to me. You know, even as a young man, I just never so anyway, I was cruising around Thailand. I'd meet a girl in the mall. I was up in Chiang Mai and there was this college student. Now I was young too. Right? I was like fucking uh, 23, right? And uh, anyway, I met her and she was sweet. She was so awesome. And I was like, wow. I, it was like, I could not believe it, man. The girl was so fucking sweet to me. You know, like I would wake up and there'd be like food on my doorstep she would have made some soup and she'd have it all bundled up and sticking in my by my door and there'd be and whenever we went out she was she was like super sweet to me and she was smart too she was a college student and i was like man this girl's fucking the best right but i would then next thing you know I, i'm meeting more girls right so i go to like i go anywhere you know the mall the, the beach you know i was meeting girls and uh, I like to go near universities, right? So I was meeting university girls. And they were all sweet to me, super sweet to me. They all could cook. They were all super thin. And they were all super, like, lovely to be with. Like, it was like, 
there was a moment. I, I think part of it was, part of it was, okay, is that I was their first foreigner. Okay. So whenever you have girls love, girls are curious. Okay. So when they're with a guy from a different race for the first time, there's something special about that. If you get a girl who's had somebody looks like you before, it's not as good. Okay. Just, just kind of FYI. It's always better to be the first one, whatever type you are. And they're a different type. You want to be the first guy of that type. And the girl will be curious. Trust me. And she'll be like, I wonder what it's like. You know, they're, they're very curious. You know, girls are, girls are like cats in a way. They're curious. Right. And so you want to be, take advantage of that. And so anyway, so <clears throat> how did that affect my mindset forever? Well, all of a sudden I realized that I, I really was honest with myself. And I was like, I don't like overweight girls anymore. Like I came back to America for like six months trying to, you know, I was trying to do what you're supposed to do. I had finished business school. I'm like, I got to, you finished business, business school before I went around the world. So I was like, I got to get a job in business. I got to do this. I got to do that. I never imagined. I, at the time, I never imagined living in Asia forever. I just, that, that was, I wanted to, but I didn't think I could, right? I thought I got to do what society expects of me. And I tried to fit in for like six months. And I just thought, man, I just, I had looked around and I thought, man, these girls are fat and they're, they're just a pain in the ass here, you know? And this is 1990, 1991 now. And I was like, it was just no, there was no comparison in the sweetness. There was no comparison in the fitness. There was no comparison in the ability to cook. There was no comparison in the, in the um, facial expressions. You know, facial expressions are a big deal. I should get into this in a full video. You know, if you watch a porn video, a lot of it is like, focusing on the girl's face i don't think guys understand how important honest facial expressions are and you can't fake them men can recognize up to a hundred thousand different expressions in human faces the reason why is we had to decide in the middle of the night someone barging through the wheat barging through the bushes if they were smiling because they were happy to see me or if they were going to kill me we had to know every nuance of the face. And a man, if you're honest with yourself, will find that fake facial expressions of ecstasy, surprise, innocence, become clown-like when you've seen the real thing. Okay, so after I had seen the real thing, I, there was, I knew, okay, this is what I'm talking about, one of those revelations when you can never go back. It was a great experience for me because I knew I could never, and I just knew, I just, one moment I just realized back in America, I saw guys slaving for women. You know what I mean? Just holding hands with these buffaloes. And I was like, wait a second. And buying them things. And I thought to myself, I knew, for better or worse, I was done with that. I, I knew there was no way I could do that anymore because I knew that my options, I just like, there's no fucking way. I didn't take, it didn't take two weeks or a year or 10 years. I knew. It's like, I knew that it was never going to be worth it to me because the prize is not there in the West. This is my biggest complaint about the West. It's not that you can't get a wife. Okay. It's not that you can't get married. It's not that you might not be married forever. It's possible. It's just that it's, and, and you know what I mean? Like the divorce court, all that stuff doesn't make any better. But even if you get it, the prize is a booby prize. It's a clown. It's, it's not real. Once you've seen real, okay? That's why you have to see real in order. And as a side note, I'm going to have one last summit before I go. And this summit is going to be focused on moving abroad right? Moving abroad. And I want to take you guys, I want to show anybody, maybe you've traveled, but moving abroad is a different thing. It's a subtle thing. If you think you know, then fine. But I'll tell you something, even if you did it before, okay, let's say you moved to Brazil, every, you know, 
if you're honest with yourself, you guys out there lived in one country, you know it's hard to do. And that there's a lot of other countries out there, they have different rules, right? I have developed a set of principles living in many countries on how to fit in and make do and make money and do good in any country. There are a set of general principles that work. And that's what I want to share at the summit. I want to, every aspect, okay, not just traveling abroad, although I travel abroad is a great first step. Because just like I said with Thailand, I went there, I felt, I saw, I learned, I changed. And that gave me the motivation to have the discipline, which is what we're talking about. Okay. I, in fact, in that case, the discipline was to move us abroad. But the decision was one of those gimmies. It was one of those easy ones. Because I literally looked at the girls here in 1991. And the quality, compared to the quality that I saw over in Asia, the quality was so low. And not only that, I mean, there's more, there's a lot more things. The girls in Asia had studied more. They knew things. They would take me to museums. They would talk about things that mattered. They would know things. They knew how to cook. They were much more interesting than the girls in the West. Here, you had a lot of know-it-alls. But you didn't have a lot of interesting conversations. I had a lot of interesting, funny conversations in Asia. And it was, and so there was a lot of motivation for me. But then, and and that led to the kind of the gimme, which is what I got. I I couldn't simp for girls here. I just couldn't. If I can do that for you, that's, I've done the miracle. If I can help you, because you think you can fight against simping, right? You, oh, I'm not going to simp. I'm not going to simp. And then you do it. You need to be inoculated, vaccinated against simping, okay? That's what going overseas, I can show you. I can show you the things that will ruin it (laughs) for you forever, okay? You will be vaccinated against Western girls and Westernized girls, okay? There are complications, and I will go over those. But believe me, your life will never be the same once you get this mindset. It's not just going abroad. It's a mindset. Anyway, okay, back to discipline. Okay. So what is discipline? And I guess I should talk a little bit about my sugar thing. Okay, so I realized eating too much sugar. Now I also realized the more I thought about it, times in my life that I started eating too much sugar. When was that? Because I don't always eat too much ice cream at night. When do I do it? The most ice cream I ever ate is when I had the baby with the girl. I found myself eating half gallon a night. Okay? A fucking half gallon. Going to Walmart, getting a fucking half gallon every day. And dusting the whole thing. And all of it in one city. Like just watching a movie or Netflix. What was I doing? Right. It was it was. It was amazing because I ate healthy all day. And then I would just fucking eat this ice cream, right? And my realization, my first realization was that when I'm unhappy or unsure or unsettled, I eat more ice cream, okay? So I use my personal faults I want to fix them okay but I also look at them as guideposts for me that I got to make a change and I kind of realized when I was eating too much ice cream back in Santa Maria I realized it was time for me to leave America is that in my internal voice was saying it's time to go back to Asia So I'm grateful to the ice cream because it really, I realized I was more unhappy than I thought. I was happy to come home. I was happy to fight as hard as I could for my daughter to fight with my blood and my guts. And I did that. I needed to give, I needed to put it all on the table. All the way to the Supreme Court. And I did that. With a Supreme Court appeal. I filed a Supreme Court appeal. 
And actually, I filed two because I filed one and then it, long story, they, they wouldn't, it took me a while. They, they wouldn't take it because of this and that it hadn't happened yet. Then I filed again a second one. Now, it turns out that the appeal would have been useless. And I found out that I had already lost. And that was when I finally gave up. But I was willing to do any fucking thing. It wasn't until I realized it wasn't going to work. Like, there was no point in it. It was just going to be a waste of three years. Up to three years. And I wasn't going to get what I wanted. I wasn't going to get what I deserved, what every man deserves, what every human. I wasn't going to get my human rights. And neither was my daughter. Once I realized that, I realized the court was not going to help me. And I gave up. So that's why I came home. Now, in the process, many good things have happened to me. Okay? Ronin Man summits have exploded. And when I mean that, I mean the energy. I mean the sharing. I mean the honesty. The ability to work as a group. The camaraderie. Is it's fucking exploded. The first summits, there was a few messages in the group chat after the summit. But that was it. Everybody was basically strangers. I never got any pictures of people hanging out together or guys weren't saying, let's do another one, let's get together, let's do it, let's do that. Nope. It was just like a bunch of guys who got a lot out of it, right? Then my first, the very first Ronin summits in Thailand. And then as they got better, right? As they got better, as I learned what, what, what it was that we were doing here, they got better. And, and, and the real explosion was when I came back to America. And, and the funny thing is, I, here's the funny thing. I thought coming back to America was going to be the end of summits because I thought, hey, in Thailand, you can get a room for 10 bucks, even three bucks. You can get a dormitory. And I thought, you know, that's perfect for a summit. Guys can come in, students, they can spend very little money. Food is like 10 bucks a day, 15 bucks a day. Everybody can come. I want everybody to be able to come to a summit. I'm like, Thailand is perfect for that. And then we, uh, then Australia, we got a art gallery. Everybody could live for free. All we needed to buy was food. You know, you just pay your entry fee and that food and then make food and hang out. And you got, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And, and it's, and it's, it's exactly what I want. I want everybody to be able to attend a summit, right? So when I came back to America, I, and this is my real mindset, I thought that was the end of summits because I thought, you know, there's no way we're going to be able to do it in people's houses in America because the houses are not big enough. You know, they're not art galleries with like 10 rooms and a huge meeting room and you know what I mean? Like a massive kitchen, like an industrial kitchen. It's not, they're not like that, right? I'm not going to be able to get a youth hostel or a fucking, we're not going to be able to afford, like if we do afford a big room or a big thing, it's going to raise the price and then everybody won't be able to go. Then the whole purpose is dead, right? So anyway, so then I came back. Again, my purpose was my daughter, but my daughter brought me to so many good things. That's the amazing thing. The, the magnet, the pull of my daughter and my love for her brought me back, right? To America. Even though I didn't want to come back. And everything good happened. The summits, people opened up their houses. And I was like, you know, Ryan in uh, La Jolla, that was an amazing summit. Just at the very beginning of lockdowns. And it happened despite the fact that the authorities were closing down over meetings with people. Helicopters were flying over our house in La Jolla. It was fucking sketchy time. I don't know if you remember back then. In the very beginning, the very first hardcore lockdown, that was when we had our summit. And they were saying it's illegal to meet. And I was worried. Like, at the time, we thought we were going to die. And nobody knew data, what was happening. And fear was running rife. And some guys didn't come. But the guys who came, it was huge. It was a great summit. A lot of guys came. And it was it was our... We looked at each other. We thought, we're all fucking ballsy guys. Like, all of us, including me. Everybody was willing to go. We're all willing to put it all on the line for what? And, that, and, and, and the what is what made that summit so good. Because we're like, fuck it. You know? Like, we are fucking warriors. We're fucking, like, we're here. All of us. I can trust all you guys, you know? And I can trust that you guys have the balls to come. And a lot of people came from far away, Right? You know, even getting on, I remember even getting on, I took an Amtrak down there 
And I remember even that everybody was like, don't get in a public. You know, it was like, it's hard to remember back how things were back in the day. Back, but you know what I mean? You forget yourself. But it, I remember because I remember like when I was planning that summit, I was like, I would have forgotten if it wasn't for the summit. But it was like, oh man, people were emailing me like, I can't do them. You know, my mom, my level, whatever, you know, my boss, if I got sick, I had, you know, there was all these, but guys came. So anyway, summits happened and they went on fire. So the good thing here, the process is, I did what I wanted to do. I had always avoiding having a child for one reason. I'm not going to tell you the reason because it's nothing to do with MGTOW. But I had avoided it. And I was worried about something. And when I talked to my brother, he said, that is nothing to worry about. This has nothing to do with this. He kind of figured out something that was in my mind was blocking me, right? And I was like, oh my God, you're right. You're right. Because I was never interested, I was never interested in getting married, never. But I did get interested in kids. I love, I love to see things grow. I love to help. I love to teach. I was teacher of the year when I was the university professor. I love it. A lot of guys say, "Oh, who can't do teach?" That's that's bullshit. Some people love to teach, and I love my teachers, my good teachers. I appreciate them. Like I write them. I I became good friends with a lot of my teachers, but I value somebody who nurtures me. Because I didn't get a lot of it in my childhood from the people I should have gotten it from. But I did get it from teachers. So I love teachers and I'm a good teacher. And I like teaching. And fuck anybody who says you can't do, you teach. They're full of shit. Maybe for them that's true. I like to teach. I enjoy seeing the light come on in other people's eyes. Okay. So where was I going with that? Okay. So here I am in the States. Because I don't want you guys to get the idea that the States is no good either. Because it is a good place. I've had a great time for almost three years. And then and, and, and people opened up their houses. And the whole tour happened. And I met so many people. And we, I, and I have so many more friends. And I know so much more of this, of this country than I did before. You know? It's amazing. It's fucking amazing. You know? And so... Oh, by the way. If I'm going to say, I want to do one summit before I leave. If I was going to say my dream summit, it would be in Canada. Because we've never done one in Canada. But I don't have a house. Probably the dream location would be Toronto. Because one of my good friends is there. But it could be Vancouver. Right? If anybody knows, if anybody has a house in, in Canada that's near, you know what I mean? A major city, things to do, things to walk to. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? But it, it's got to be a it's got to be a pretty good place where we're not always getting in cars and stuff. It's got to be like you know, kind of Ronin style, right? You know how it is, right? You see where we've done them. You know what we get up to, right? If you got a house like that and you want to open it up and you're reliable one hundred percent, I'd love to do a summit in Canada before I leave. I know it's going to be colder, but I know there's a lot of awesome guys in Canada, and I've wanted to do a Canadian one forever. It's just far away from me, so it's not convenient for me. So I got to figure that out. But if anybody knows, I'd love to do that before I leave. And that means soon, boys. Soon, okay? Because I'm working on getting my, my health certificate now for my Thai visa. And then I got to go down and get my proof I'm not a criminal visa uh, from the uh, police. I gotta, you got to get that for your retirement visa. You got to get these stupid papers. You don't have elephantitis and you're not a criminal. You got to get all these papers. So I'm going to get these papers, turn them in. About three weeks later, I'll have my Thai visa and I'm gone. Okay. So maximum six weeks is what I'm thinking. I'm going to be out of here. Okay. So the summit has to be within six weeks. Okay. So let's go back to the next step of discipline. You know, I did, I felt like I had to give a shout out to America because although there are things I don't like here. I am not an ungrateful person. I should say a little bit more. My basic personality, my thinking, my, my education, a lot of good people who helped me were here in America when I was a kid. And that formed my personality today. You know, the outdoors, the logic, the science, 
the way that people cut through bullshit here, there are a lot of good things here. And I'm not saying I could never live here. I'm not saying that. I'm saying for me right now, I don't see, I don't see a project that is interesting enough to stay. You know, I'm not feeling the call, right? I just got a call from a friend in Japan. He has a project he wants to do. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, I would say it's, 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 um, filthy enough. No, <laughs> no, he used to be, this is a good, he spoke at the summit in, uh, you guys remember anybody who came to the Japan summit, Jeff, we went to his office and he, he does the classes, the sex classes. Yeah. Jeff has a project and he wants to do. And so I was like, he called me last night for like two hours and he's like, I'm not sure I'm going to do it with him, but he, he really wants me to come back to Japan and do a project related to girls and making some money and uh, pretty interesting. So I'm thinking about that. That's the most interesting project I got right now. So it is what it is. If you got something in America, uh, you know what? I'm going to digress a little more. If you got something going on in America that's hot and happening, don't give that up just to leave, okay? If you're living your dream, you raised money and you're working on a project that's awesome, <clears throat> dude, the America is a great place to do it. Look at Elon Musk. The guy came over from South Africa. I mean, would he want to be anywhere else? The ecosystem here that allowed him to build SpaceX, the boring company, Starlink, Neuralink, Tesla, Tesla Energy. I mean, could he have done that anywhere else? He might like the sunsets better in South, South Africa, but at the end of the day, you got to consider everything as a man. Your wisdom comes in, right? And his wisdom is like, this is the best place to be for me. So it depends on what you're doing, okay? America can be a good place, no doubt about it. And for me, at this moment in time, and you got to look at yourself, and again, you can always come back. You, you're not like this, you know, like a, somebody who's like, if this guy gets elected, I'm going to leave forever. No, it's like, no. What am I doing now? How many years do I have to live? What do I want to fucking experience? Am I in something that's super hot right now? Right? You know what I mean? Am I living my dream? Or could I use a couple of years doing something else? Right? You know what I mean? Is there any harm in it? There's no harm in it. Right? For most people. So, in fact, there's a fuck ton of benefits, right, for most people. So, there you go. There's my kind of balanced view of going abroad. We'll talk more about it. Okay, so discipline. So, with the sugar thing, I had trouble, okay? I don't usually have trouble with things. Usually, I decide something, and that's kind of it for me. But I found myself every night about uh, 6 o'clock. Six, seven o'clock. Man, I have a tough time. Even now, even tonight, I'm sure. I still have a tough time. I start jonesing for sugar, for for ice cream. Like just jonesing, jonesing. And, and I thought to myself, oh shit. Sugar is more dangerous than I thought. I didn't think it would be this hard. Because I, it wasn't this hard with many things. Sugar is harder than I thought. Maybe I ate more sugar and I got to a lower level, you know, the same substance that you do more of, it's more difficult depending on how much it's, 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 you dug in, right? I guess I got dug in too far with sugar, maybe because it's my, like my one vice, you know what I mean? So it's like, ah, it's so easy for me to say you deserve one vice and I do deserve one vice, but I, but here's the thing. I want a vice that's not going to hurt me, right? So and I realized that the amount of ice cream I was eating, okay, be very careful what you're hearing, not you, talk about myself, was hurting me. So I realized that I was, this was kind of my, those, those cravings, those jonesing, I realized I need, this is what I learned in AA. One thing I learned in 12-step programs that was great is that sometimes you need a little help. And in the 12-step in, in, in things, you got your meetings, right? But for sugar, I didn't have any meetings, but I thought, okay, I need something more. I need something to bolster my ability to not eat ice cream at night. 
Okay. So I thought, what could work for me? I thought, you know what I'm going to try? I'm going to do, I'm going to search documentaries on sugar. And that was eye opening. So I searched sugar documentary on YouTube and I just started watching videos. I watched about five so far. And maybe four, four or five. And they, each of them has been eye-opening. And I can tell you, I learned so much about a lot of things. About obesity, it's not really the obesity of an epidemic that is anything to do with sugar. It's, 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 it's more subtle. I thought, I knew. I said, hey, I'm not eating ice cream. I'm not obese. Because I never was obese. See, that's the thing. When I was eating a lot of ice cream, I would have a tiny little bit extra on my gut, but it wasn't, nobody else cared. It wasn't like a big deal. I was like a 33. I, I was not by any means fat. I wasn't as ripped as I do get when I'm not eating ice cream and I'm doing yoga every day, okay? So there's a difference, which I want to be. But I wasn't anything that anybody was telling me. There's nothing kind of alarming happening in my body. That's number one. So why would I quit sugar? Think about it. Why would Ronin Man quit sugar? Okay, so for me, I started to think about things. My cousin is a diabetic. He's a type 1 diabetic. He got it in junior high school. And he passed out when we were visiting. And uh, I went to the hospital. And they're like, your son had a, uh, what is that called? Uh... I forget the name. There's a name for it. And he just totally passed out, could have died. And they gave him insulin, right? And he, to this day, from that day to this day, takes three insulin shots a day. And so that's type 1 diabetes. That's the type of diabetes that's in your genes. That's not from eating too much sugar. That's in your genes. So what that means to me, okay, and each person has their own. All of this is the thought process that starts before the discipline, guys. It's all important, okay? So listen to all of this because when you make a decision, you're going to have to go into yourself. I'm not telling you to quit sugar here. I'm telling you the process that I went through to make my decision with enough force and then the tweaks on the end to actually do it. So I could make a decision and follow through like a man, okay? And that's, and that's the end result. And, 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 and people say, oh, like, man, oh, yeah, you so, uh, hey, there are things that you do like a man and you'll feel like a man and you'll think about it and you'll be like, you're not like Spider-Man, okay? <laughs> okay, you're not becoming another, you're like, ooh, ooh, I like this. This one's good. This one's good. I waited, I analyzed, I thought, and when I was ready when my gut was ready, when my mind was ready, when I was ready, I quit. And that was it. And it is beautiful. Okay, it is a beautiful thing. It makes you feel good about yourself. Now, I'm not saying in the future I might decide something more moderate. Okay, but for now, there's no way. I need to go totally off sugar. And I watched these documentaries and I could not believe what I learned is that they have done enough medical studies that they can tie very interesting. There's a, there's a book called Fat Chance. And the author, I'll put the uh, link uh, in the uh, comment section. There's, there's a, there's a, there's a uh, now I'm not saying I like this guy's personality or anything, but what he talks about, this is a great speech. And there's so much truth to it. He doesn't assign blame to things. He looks at the chemistry. He looks at the science and he fixes it from there. And one of the things he comes to a very reasonable scientific conclusion is that there's enough evidence to say that when you eat more sugar, there is more heart problems, liver problems, every heart attacks, of course, diabetes, it's, it's not 
what I thought when I started watching these documentaries, again, I was just trying to get a second wave of kind of ability to withstand the desire to eat sugar at night. And I read, watched these documentaries. And what it gave to me was a very solid one. And that is, is that the sugar, the fat around your liver is different. You can't measure how much fat's around in your liver. The fatty liver, okay? That comes from alcohol, drinking too much alcohol, which I don't do, and from sugar. And they, they looked at the Malaysian population before fast food came in and sugary drinks and after. And they looked at different countries like Muslim nations where booze wasn't sold in the stores, where they drank more sugary drinks. And people that drink a lot of alcohol don't drink as many sugary drinks, okay? So that, that's why it was especially interesting for them to see Malaysia. Because when it opened up to fast food, Coca-Cola and all that, they could track year by year the amount of diabetes, the amount of heart attacks, the amount of strokes, you know, liver failures. They could, they could track. People are needing liver transplants because of sugar now, believe it or not. It has become a huge thing. I, I, I really didn't realize. I, okay, don't get me wrong. I knew sugar wasn't good. And I knew there's a lot of sugar in manufactured products, okay? So when you see a can, when you see a box, I knew that they added a lot of sugar to it. When you see a raw vegetable, there's no added sugar, right? When you see a cow, you know, when you see a pig, okay, there is no added sugar. But when you see a processed food, a processed, then you got sugar. Then you got extra added chemicals. Then you got added stuff, right? So I knew that. And I knew there was sugar in, like, I people had told me there's, like, a ton of sugar in ketchup. There's a ton of sugar in spaghetti sauce. There's a ton of sugar in this and that. In in uh, salad dressing, there's a ton of So I had kind of half-assed, tried to eat a little less here and there. But I didn't really understand that sugar was a big deal for me because I was never overweight. I always thought, hey, I'm fine. Now, here's the thing. I don't know if it was my imagination, but when I was eating all that sugar at night in Santa Maria, my feet just felt a little bit more cold. My feet have always been cold. My, my, my circulation of my feet has never been great. Even in high school when I used to go skiing, it was always a little bit, they were colder than other people. For some reason, the, the, the circulation in my feet is not great. And I have to kind of be very wary of my feet. I have a couple weaknesses in my body. One of them is my skin and the other one is my feet circulation. So I always kind of knew that because my feet were always colder. And I'm like, hey, my feet are cold. And then my dad, ah, you're complaining. And then uh, my mom touched me. She's like, oh my God, his feet are like ice cold. And he's like, and people like, everybody looked at each other like, why is his feet cold? And nobody, get some better socks. You need better socks. And I had better socks. Didn't matter. The circulation wasn't as good, right? So diabetes affects your feet. And as you get older, also, there's another factor. Your circulation's not as good. Now, my circulation's good because my veins are pumping and I'm lifting weights. So I walk, you know, a gazillion miles a day. It's not a big deal for me. The aging thing hasn't really caught up to me. But, you know, it's something to think about for the future, right? So anyway, I was thinking, you know, I don't know if it's my imagination or not. But my feet are just not feeling that great in a way. You know what I mean? And I thought, you know what? I'm going to... And the sugar, I'm eating too much. And... I keep doing this and I thought, you know, I'm going to try this stopping sugar at night because I don't eat sugar any other time. A minor amount in sauces and things, you know, which I'm actually, after watching these documentaries, I'm actually thinking about really cutting out more sugar, you know. And so they're, they're linking sugar to Alzheimer's too. And so, you know, I um, I got my bolstering, okay, now. So I have discipline. It was very difficult to quit sugar at night. It was difficult. Partly because I wasn't doing it in the day, so I felt like, you know what I mean? And I wasn't overweight. And I thought, you know, 
I, uh, I guess I was like not sure I was ready until I was ready. And in Santa Maria, I was suddenly ready. I was like, man, I'm ready. I'm ready. So discipline, part of discipline is you wait till you're ready. Okay, don't, don't push it early. And, and there's a reason for that. Okay, let's call it a spiritual reason. And it's not a spiritual, it's not like God or anything. It's like you don't want to waste chances in life. Okay, there's like a rule. Some things don't come that often. And you got to grab onto them. And discipline is not, it's, it's more of a ghost or grabbing onto a wind that's passing. It's a difficult thing to do. Catching the wind. Catching a wave. It's not easy. It's not like starting an engine and just going. You're trying to catch this energy, right? When discipline, think of it more as catching an energy. It's, it's like something that is, is like you got to be ready for it. You got to throw your body into it in the right way, right? You might have to have, you know, for flying some kind of, you know, some kind of wings, like a wing suit or bigger to catch the power of the wind, right? If you break the rules, you're just going to hit the ground, right? So discipline looks like strength, right? But it's more like catching wind. Catching the wind, catching the impossible. Jumping, you know, catching the wave and allowing, just keeping your body in just the right position that it holds you and takes you. And it takes you long enough Okay, the wind takes you long, and here's where the analogy ends. That you're back on the ground, and it's done. It's part of you. And it's integrated into you. You now don't drink. You now don't eat sugar at night. You've changed. And people are like, whoa, you know. And, and, and so it takes time. It takes time because when you're learning something, when you're starting, and that's what kind of discipline is, like learning something. You're learning how to do something and implementing it at the same time. And as you do that, you're in a weak state in the beginning. Okay? I tested. It was somebody's birthday the other day here in the house. And one of the girls made a cake. And she always cooks good. I know she's a, good, she's a very good baker. And so I, I sat down at the table and everybody had a huge piece of cake. And I usually have the biggest piece of cake. Plus I have another one because it was chocolate. And I, I didn't want to hurt everybody's feelings. I said, just give me the smallest possible piece you can cook, cut as a uh, ceremonial piece. And the guy whose birthday was, wasn't very smart about it, actually. He cut me a very extremely small piece. And everybody was like, okay, cool. He's trying to eat less sugar. Nobody said anything. Because I guess it was your week at the beginning. So I had this tiny little piece. I mean, really, like I'm talking... Smaller than a Snickers bar worth of sugar, for sure. And it was a birthday party. And that was the only challenge I had. So it's not like alcohol where you don't ever eat it again, ever in your life. And I know that when I eat a piece of bread even, like a whole wheat bread, I know there's a little bit of sugar. So that adds complications to sugar. But I have totally stopped what I was doing. Okay, absolutely, totally stopped. And it is a miracle. And I am kind of amazed that it turned out to be this meaningful because I now look at watching these documentaries and I'm really learning. I thought it was the obesity. I always thought it was the obesity epidemic. But actually, the science says there's some people who are pretty big and healthy, actually. Not, I'm not talking, you know, like morbidly obese, but there are people who are like big and healthy and other people who are skinny and they have, um, what's the, what's the, uh, metabolic syndrome, metabolic syndrome, sugar, right? And, uh, you know, so I, uh, am just very grateful that, uh, and this is when my, uh, you know, every time that I have discipline, I use a lot of the program, uh, the A program, the things I learned in the program. Now you're not an alcoholic and I'm not here to, I am not one of these guys at all. Trust me. I don't think you should stop anything that I stop because I stop. 
everything. And that's my whole thing is that I want you to analyze every aspect of things you're doing in your life based on you, okay? I talked about myself, my genetics, my actions, my realizations, my feelings in my body, my behaviors, my motivations, and finally, my decision, and then how I stuck to that decision. This is how you show discipline. Discipline's not a perfect word, okay? It's the best word I can come up with for the thing that humans call discipline. Because I think the word discipline, or at least the way it's used, shows a, a self-will more than I think it really is. A lot of it is understanding yourself and having reasons. Reasons will get you through the tough spots. You need to back up your self-will with more. It's not just self-will, guys. If you really want to do something, you got to attack it on every level. Self-will helps. Nothing wrong with fucking self-will, okay? That's the, and also that guttural feeling I got, a, that disgusting feeling I talked about. I got to change. Book this shit. You know what I mean? There's, that is valuable. I'm not getting, don't get me wrong. That's incredibly valuable in its own right. But it's not everything. It won't get you where you want to go. You need more. I hope that my journey to stopping eating sugar at night, okay? Now, weeding it out of every sauce and everything, I might do that over time, actually. And I've, yeah, I've really taken it more seriously. But it wasn't my original goal, and it's not part of my right now plan. My goal was very clear, and that was stop eating sugar at night. And I have stopped that. And I have come up with reasons to keep stopped. And I feel great. My feet, I've noticed, it might be in my imagination, but my feet feel better, actually. My feet feel better. They feel warmer and uh, they just feel better. I can't wait to go back to Thailand and get a foot massage because foot massage is awesome for blood flow. And it's $3 an hour. I'll take you to the place. Three bucks an hour. You got to tip the guy. Three bucks an hour. Get a killer. The best foot massage. The best back massage. Awesome. And, and it's, like a, it's like literally a three, four minute walk from where we're going to eat all the time. So it, it's, it, it's a can't lose thing. It's so cheap and so good. And we'll be laughing, sitting next to each other, having a massage. So I look forward to the summit in, uh, in Thailand too. And seeing you guys. First, so I want to end on this. If anybody knows a house, doesn't have to be in Canada. Okay. I prefer it if it's convenient to me. I'm in, I'm in Santa Cruz right now. So if I'm in California, if in California, it's great. Doesn't have to be. I'm open. I want to do one last summit. And the topic is being an expat, moving abroad. All that encapsulates. And like I said, you might have done it before, but if you've done it before, you're going to want to come even more because the depth, the well of knowledge is deep and search yourself. You'll know you don't have all the answers. You'll know there's many countries and even just choosing the country is valuable. Just choosing the right country is incredibly valuable. And it's not as easy as you think. It's not as easy as you think. Well, the more you, the more you do it, the more you expat, for lack of a better word, the more you realize, damn, the place I choose is really important. How do I know before I live there what it's going to be like? We're going to talk about all aspects, including making money and choosing the right place, making the right first moves, second moves, third moves, mistakes that you can make that are just deadly for your happiness, for your physical health for your long-term ability, right? How to keep learning when you stay there. You know, it's stuck. A lot of guys, when they go overseas, they get stuck in the same fucking exact life they had back home. That is not necessary. That, when you go abroad, it's a great chance to make the changes you need to make so that your life doesn't get recreated in the new place, which is exactly what will happen if you don't know this. You will find yourself if you 
had debt back home, you will move somewhere and you will build a house and you'll find yourself owing money. And if you have a problem with the relationship, you're going to find a relationship. It's, you're going to make, you're going to recreate. I'll end on this. When the Japanese built houses during the bubble in the outback, it wasn't quite the outback, but it was kind of outbacky in Australia. My friend was involved. He was a friend of the developer. And guess how they built them? They built, <laughs> kid you not, they built them within a foot of each other, all the houses. In the, there's land everywhere, but the Japanese developer, all he knew in, was Tokyo. So all he knew was how to build everything right next to each other. He couldn't see, <laughs> he couldn't see the land and how to use the land and give people space and privacy and take advantage of it. It's because his mindset hadn't changed. Now, of course, that development was a failure, right? No one wanted to live a foot away from people in the outback, right? <clears throat> they don't mind having neighbors, but they want to not take a shit and have the guy hear them, right? You know, <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> you know, throw, throw, a, throw a, something out of the front door and hit, hit somebody in the face. They don't want that, right? Because they're, 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 they, don't, they don't need that. You know, it's stupid, right? That's how you look when you go overseas. Most people, they recreate their life exactly the way it was. So not only not to do that, but how to take advantage and be a fish in water in this new environment. Pick the best environment. Make the best decisions. Redo every fucking decision. This is my last call to guys who've expatted before. How many of you guys, you went to a new country, you acted just like you acted before, and you got what you got before. I'm going to show you how when I went to Japan, I got there and lived a certain way. And when I moved to China, I completely changed my thinking and how it affected my life in major ways. It was a spiritual almost because it enlarged my life. And it made me feel good too because I had a little bit of an, you know, kind of inferior complex about, inferiority complex about certain things, certain kind of people, some kind of groups. And when I moved to Shanghai, it was my third country. I'd lived in Sweden. I had lived in Japan. And now I moved to Shanghai. And I learned. And I'm going to tell you what I learned and how I put it in practice. And how it changed my life and how it made my life bigger. So there's a lot of things you can do when you go. Not just adapt and survive. Thrive and kick ass in a new location. All right, guys. I hope this has been useful. And I really hope that, uh, if nothing else, I hope this has helped you not to do, make a bunch of dumb decisions to do stuff. I'm going to quit this and then not do it. Because that is the worst feeling. All right, guys. Ronan Man signing off. I'm glad you're here. And thanks for listening.